So before we get started, I'm just wondering if we could have a show of hands of how many people have already seen the piece. Okay. Two. So that will help us know how to go forward. <laughs> um, and I'm assuming most of the rest of you will see the piece. Yes? Okay, lovely, lovely. Um, okay, great. Um, so I wonder if, um, if you want to, we talked about um, earlier, if you want to say something about what it means to have a conversation about this piece before seeing it. Yes, I think I would, I would um, not agree with Pierre that this piece <laughs> needs a preparation. Um, of course, we can do that, and uh, we can speak. But, but um, I really believe in all my works in the direct ex artistic experience of a work. And I also don't want to give you a certain uh, frame through which you should see the piece. Because the idea of this piece, as all of the other pieces I did before, Stift das Dinge was here 10 years ago in the Armory. The idea is precisely that I'm not asking for a certain understanding. I'm not, ask, I'm not staging symbols. I'm not staging something which should be understood as something else. So uh, to mention the sheep at the very last time, um, um, for me, they were sheep. And they were not, not standing for something else. And of course, some, somebody might think of them in a political way, or in a religious way, or in a farmer way, or in a, a vegetarian way, whatever. Um, but for me, I don't think that way. I don't use anything on stage, also tonight, and you will see a lot of materials and a lot of people involved. Um, nothing has for me a sim symbolic um, function which means um, I don't mind if you say I don't understand it. Because for me, understanding very much is a reduction to what you already know, or it is an intimidation of, of an audience who is supposed to understand that the horse in the corner should mean something uh, to the knight in the, in, the, in the text or something. I don't work that way. I offer materials, that's why this wonderful uh, opera by Louis Andriessen, The Materie, also inspired me so much. I love the encounter with materials, the encounter, of course, with, with performers, with bodies, with the space, with the sounds. And I believe in these forces. And I think that these forces ha might have a completely different uh, effect on you individually. And already uh, I spoke to some of the people who have seen the piece before in the last days or in Manchester. And then they said, yes, this, this scene, they explained me a certain scene. I said, great, but I didn't think about that. Uh, but I, will, I, I love it, and they are right. And uh, so, of course, I have things in mind. We might speak about it now, but I never occupy a meaning. I never occupy the center of a piece. I surround topics with my materials, with the materials I'm working with. I surround them, but I don't occupy the center of, um, of how to make sense of it. Sorry that it took so long. No, no, it's good. Um, so that also brings up this idea that that means that the audience basically is responsible for their own meaning making, setting up a slightly different, you know, social interaction necessarily than the the statement of okay, this means this. This is a symbol for this. Um, do you? Though, though, I might, I like to um, question the idea of social mm -hmm. because. Um, Social means a lot in the ways I develop and prepare a piece. It's never my, my idea. It's the result of a very collaborative work. But 
Social doesn't exclude that you in the audience, you're sitting there alone, even when you come with your husband or with your daughter or with your son or your mother. Uh, or yesterday we had this, fortunately we had uh, hundreds of, of students from schools around New York here. Of course they were sitting together socially, but they react individually. I think when I look at myself, when everybody laughs, when everybody who is around me laughs about something, I, I probably don't. <laughs> and um, I think when I look back to strong theatrical, strong, strong artistic experiences, in the moment you are really touched by something, you are alone. You don't say, hey, did you see this? Or what it means for me? No, in this moment you're really alone. That's why social can means that afterwards you have something to talk, and I'm sure you have something to talk about this piece <laughs> later, but in the moment of an, of an performance and of perception and making such an artistic experience with the work and with the sound, I think you're pretty alone. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. It makes me think about um, the uniqueness of the theatrical form in being able to give you that experience and in what ways that's different than experiencing in a museum or experiencing by dancing with people in what ways that um, changes the artistic um, relationship. Does that feel like something really special about the form of theater to you? Yes, yes, I think um, also the concentration you have when you sit there for two hours. Um, and because in a museum you might walk by and and you don't have the, right. the you don't have the um, intensity of a certain duration, which which um, is already immersive to our totally, way of perceiving. Totally. Okay, um, so another thing that seems very special about um, the way you make work is how interdisciplinary it is, um, defying categories, um, because uh, there's no hierarchy between the arts. There's not that the music is more important than the visuals, or the text is more important than um, any certain movement. Um, so I was just wondering if you could talk about that aspect of it and if you see that as relating to um, how meaning is constructed individually in people and that, dare I say, democratic way yes. of handling things. Yes, you could say that. Um, I'm not a, I'm not a um, traditional director, but I think when you have, um, I think we will easily agree Pierre, who works a lot with opera, when you have a, when you have to stage an existing work, you have a, they have quite an, a line of hierarchies. Yeah, to yeah. you have uh, the composer has already a libretto, got a libretto which was first, and he composed, and um, then the director has, uh, is working with it. So there is a, there is a certain um, lines which which are more important than others, or which just be there from the, from the beginning. And this means a lot, being there from the beginning. Yeah. It means that the, those things who are there the, at the first place, like the, the li libretto and the opera, is structuring everything. And I believe strictly that we can only change the performing arts or the Yes, opera, theater. When we change the structure, because in the structure is already a, a, lot, a lot of decisions already made. The role of the audience, the linearity of a story, or other decisions. And I believe that we need to change the structure, and that is why I always, with all my works, I start with everything at the same time. Of course, I have a certain period of conceptual um, 
work before. For example, here it was a book which inspired me to start this work. Um, but when I go and when I start to work on stage or when I start to speak with my team, I start with everything at the same time. And when, when I started this piece, I made it, I made a very early decision to, to work with dancers instead of actors or performers. Um, and this is new for you? It was new for me because I'm not a choreographer. Mm -hmm. But I told them, I'm not a choreographer, I'm sorry. Um, but I give you stuff to work with. And I gave the dancers a lot of materials. And I was interested in the encounter between the dancers and those materials. Mm -hmm. Because usually when you see dance performance, this has many reasons, but um, the dancers are the subjects on stage. They show you what they can do. They, they, um, um, they react to music or to light, but basically, and this has also to do with uh, that, that dance is a lighter art form which can travel more easily and things like this. Usually, um, dancers are the um, subjects on stage. And I wanted them to be in in encounter with other forces. Mm -hmm. So I gave them materials. And we start, I made, last year, I made four, four workshops, one in Germany, one in France, one in Viet Vietnam, and one in Manchester, to invent um, a language of images and also of sounds. And there were musicians there from the first workshop. There were the, the video designer was there, light, light. Uh, we were working with light. All the elements were already there from the very first day in order to create a collaborative um, practice, which is not just following my idea, but which is a result of many voices who are part of this process. Yeah, totally. So one of um, the other inspirations for it was also John Cage's Your Operas 1 and 2, which you had um, uh, done a production of a number of years ago, um, which has a very uh, particular structure, a lot of um, chance-determined uh, uh, in term, I'm trying to figure out how to explain it very quickly. Um, the way um, Cage's Your Opera's work is that he took material from a number of different operas and then used the um, I Ching to, um, through chance operations, make a structure putting back together within his own aesthetics. Um, so one of the things you do in this piece is you use set pieces from that piece. But I also wondered in what other ways his way of structuring things has inspired you? Uh, a lot, because yeah. um, already before I really knew your operas, I believed, this goes more back to, to Bertolt Brecht, I believed in the separation of elements. So I believed in the fact that all art forms which are um, contributing to theater um, should have their own strength and life. So also the light is not something which is only make the, making the singer or actor visible, but the light is an art form which can speak and can even replace a performer. And um, this goes back actually to Brecht. And, and uh, what John Cage did in Europras is super radical. He says nothing has anything to do with each other except by chance. So costume, set design, RER, um, light, um, everything is independent and controlled by a chance-operated computer. And what I like, and I think this, this sentence that nothing is connected um, except by chance, less radical as in John Cage's uh, concept. But this is something which is shining through this production mm -hmm. as well, because to make 
conscious connections means to produce um, a meaning. Mm -hmm. And I always mistrust, mistrust that. I mistrust it when other directors uh, want to show me what they think of the world. And um, I mistrust myself. Mm -hmm. So, for example, this is one reason why in this piece, um, from time to time, whatever happens on stage is interrupted by the news of the day. It's a news channel, Euronews, which shows every day um, uncommented, unmoderated news, new news fo footage, shootage. And um, so you hear voices, you see something what's happening, you see the city where it's happening or the country, the date where it's from, but you don't know really what's going on. You have to make your mind. You have to make sense of what you see and what you hear. And this idea of no command or this idea of nothing is connected by, then by chance is, I think, a really creative force for your attention. And that's why I use it in this piece yeah, very strongly. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that form happening in American news. Um, just all, all we, we just see it when no one is telling us what it means. Yeah. Um, that was, but that was a very often comment which I heard to this piece uh, I showed in the Armory 10 years ago, Stift das Dinge, because there's really no, nobody on stage. It was this piece with only with pianos and water and fog and ice and rain and uh, stones and things. And a lot of people came to me after the piece and they said, finally, nobody on, sta nobody on stage to tell me what to think. And I thought it was a great compliment. <laughs> and um, I tried to make uh, somebody who said, uh, who saw an earlier rehearsal of this piece, he said, hmm, that's a bit like this other piece with humans, but still with the freedom of um, what you think about it. Yeah, yeah. So I would love to hear more about that process of starting in the room of that first workshop where you had musicians, you had dancers. Also, um, th those, um, those, what collaborators have been with you since the very beginning of the project? Because my understanding is that the musicians and the, the dancers that we see here are not necessarily the people you were working with on the workshops. Uh, no, I work with them, but not oh. on all workshops. Okay. Like um, all the dancers you see, except one, were already a result of a call which I made last year mm -hmm. in Germany. And it was supposed to be a casting. So we made a five or six day workshop and we had like more than 200 applications and we chose 10 dancers from their biographies and videos and things. And it was supposed to be a casting and after two days I thought, wow, they work so well with each other and they didn't know each other before. And I think it has to do with the fact that they all had a third person to, uh, or a third force to work with, mm -hmm. those elements, those materials, those stage design things. Mm -hmm. And after a week, I said to them, I would like to have all of you being involved. So that's the main cast. And oh, then so I'm originally you weren't imagining that many people? Yes, I imagined 10 people. Oh, yeah. okay. And then I invited also one of the Vietnamese dancers mm -hmm. whom I met in Hanoi in my workshop, and I invited four of the French musicians whom I met in the workshop in Paris. And uh, so, I so I had a story with everybody before we came to Manchester. So had, all, had the musicians worked together before? Were they used to playing together? No, but we had one work, workshop in Paris for, in, um, for one week. And then in prior workshops as you were developing the piece, you didn't necessarily have these musicians or these instruments, correct? I had other musicians and yeah. other instruments, yes. I will 
also the sax player, he was in the first workshop already. Mm. So I, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's an experience from these workshops, yeah. who is now on stage. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I'm, it makes me wonder how, um, how essential, the, for instance, this instrumentation is. It is a very weird instrumentation. Oh yeah, maybe say. we should talk about what it is. <laughs> yeah, because it's five, five, there are five musicians. And I love to think of it as what art history calls um, anachronic, which means when there's more time zones, uh, not anachronistic, that's a different thing, but anachronic means when there's more time zones communicating with each other in one piece of art. And um, this is here as well visually happening because you see um, opera stage designs from the 17th century and um, of course also from the 20th century. Um, but you have also five instruments which come from a different period. Like maybe the oldest one, so to speak, is um, a pipe organ. Um, but at the same time, it's built by the musician who plays the pipe organ. But at the same time, it's played with digital programs. Uh, but you have this very medieval instrument, in a way. Then you have a saxophone, uh, which was invented in the end of the 19th century. And I think actually the beginning. The beginning of the 19th century. Yeah. Beginning. Wow. In the 1820s, I think. OK, cool. Not, this, I mean, not the one we have here. Totally. Stage, what we have here is, uh, is obviously, yeah. I mean, especially in the context of New York City, the saxophone is much more known yeah. with the history of jazz. But it's but. Inter interesting, the p different periods. And then we have an instrument which was created in the beginning of the 20th century, on the Martineau. It's so, sort of one of the first synthesizers, uh, which was mainly uh, used by or famous because of the work of Olivier, Olivier Messiaen. And you also will hear one piece of Olivier Messiaen and uh, the soloist, which is playing this instrument in very different uh, improvisational uh, temperatures. Um, she's also a very famous uh, Messiaen soloist. She just came from, from Russia. Uh, she's French, but she came from Russia and performing there, other Messiaen pieces. And then we have... Um, uh, somebody who's playing di digital electronics. It looks like he has a guitar, but um, don't believe it. Yeah? <laughs> he used the guitar to treat the electronic sounds and samples and processes in a m m more complex and uh, richer way. And we have one of the old, most um, the oldest instruments of the world, which is percussion, uh, also performed by a French uh, percussionist. And um, so, so this range of instruments, they improvise together in, within certain frames, guidelines, but they create the music new every night. And I said, I don't know exactly what video, what, what news will be in the evening, but I also don't know necessarily what the music will bring to me. And I, there's also a lot of freedom uh, in what the dancers do with these materials. And this is all in order to surprise me and to surprise you. Because I don't want to create a piece which I had in mind before. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. It would be boring. So I need to be surprised. And I created the space in which this can happen. And of course, you can also say, because I'm a composer, I composed mm -hmm. the relationship between light and video and between movement and sound, between text and, um, and the space, who, which plays an important role. How different is it performance to performance? You, are you going again tonight? No. Uh, then. Then I would know. <laughs> it is. It is. 
It is uh, not different on the order of scenes. Mm -hmm. It is different in the, in the elegance of transitions or in the surprising creativity of what the performers um, invent every day. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, mm -hmm. a couple of things I've never seen before, though we pe performed this piece already several times for two weeks in Manchester. Uh, so they have freedom and they like to surprise me and yeah. it's happening. Yeah. yeah. What, what is the range of structures in place? For instance, you know that at one point you're gonna have a quote from Messiaen, but at another point, is, are there sections where it's just free improv? Not from the scratch. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. have, as I said, we have guidelines. Totally. Um, what are some of what are some of the guidelines? Just to give us a hint of what that could be. Guideline could be that in one scene only the saxophone player is playing. That's a good guideline. <laughs> and he's playing. Uh, he's playing. He um, he has this technique of circular breathing. And he's playing over and over again without breathing, which is um, already an amazing effect. Yeah, on yeah. The, and he has also very specific technique and aesthetic which he developed in his career, um, which is um, also connected with his Sicilian um, biography. So there's something very personal. And, um, but he also changes every night. Mm. So what, what he's doing. Um, what was it like? Oh, let's talk about how um, both for this piece and other pieces, you often make these pieces for unconventional spaces. They're not going in your normal um, proscenium uh, theater. What is your attraction to making pieces in those spaces, and what was it like to make to bring this piece here and translate it to a new space? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting question because first of all, I think. I am better in those spaces mm -hmm. because those spaces give me something. They, they provoke me. They, they don't. Was heißt verzeihen? What? Forgiving. Yes, they don't forgive um, theatricalities. For example, mm -hmm. I mean, when you work on a stage, you are used since hundreds of years to do as if to pretend you're somebody else or to make a gesture too, but too big. Or uh, you, when you work in such a space, it would be ridiculous immediately. So they don't forgive you for the, those um, um, representational strategies which you're used to doing in, in, in theater houses. And they add something with this, with a, because they have a character. They're not built for neutral performances or for a certain um, representation of theater, they have a character. This character of the armory is so different from the Manchester um, Mayfield Depot, which is an old, rotten, old, rotten, wet, dirty, over acoustic and full of pitch and shit place in which we, in which we performed the first the first 10 shows. And this gave a very strong, um, also sort of dystopian character to the performance. Here, this is mundane, is, uh, but it, at the same time, it has quite um, intriguing and also ambivalent, or at least ambivalent military history, which connects very directly with the text Mm -hmm. Because the text is always speaking or starting to speak about the First World War and then it's shifting away to the whole 20th century. But um, it's a starting point. So it connects very directly with here, with the, the lobby through which we go and through the space and knowing what has happened in this, what, what is the function of the space. Those functional spaces, first of all, have usually a strong aesthetic, which is also functional, but um, there's, because it is functional, it doesn't raise so many questions. An aesthetic which a designer has 
thought of or an ar architect has dreamed of. And then you always think, yes, but why did he put this here? And <laughs> why is the organ on this side? And things like I saw a, 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 just a new, have you been in Porto, in the new uh, building of Rem Kohlhaas? Uh, there's a new concert building in Portugal. And there's two organs on both sides. And, and then they look historical. And then I, I went there just recently um, because we prepare a concert there. And then I said, oh yes, can we use the organ? And it says, no, there's just staffage. It's, 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 it's just <laughs> because, because the acoustic, acoustic guy of this house said, we need something on the wall to, to stop the reflections. And then the architect said, oh yes, let's make an old Portuguese organ. And um, all these things. So, but a functional hall doesn't raise these questions. It doesn't raise the wrong questions. And that's why it's a strong partner to work in. And it adds a lot to, to, to the, to, and it changes the piece. For example, the production in Manchester was longer, was like yeah. two hour 40 or two hour 45. Um, also because we had a, a rooftop which was really in danger to fall apart, but, but it was, uh, had a fantastic view all over the city and we could add another, add another scene on the rooftop. Mm. Uh, we can't do that here. Um, so we changed also for other transition uh, moments, we changed the piece and now it's like two hours 15 or something like this. Yeah. So, um, it has a lot of consequences in which you, in which wo space you work, and and the work itself is open enough to be open to those changes. Yes, also and to be open to see and breathe and smell the space in which yeah, we are. Yeah, um, because this piece is so much about Europe. Does it feel different doing it here in America? Uh, the first word, of, the first word of this book is starts with the Americans. So right. it's not really about Europe. <laughs> it's because it's we have a complicated really, it's relationship. really starts with the First World War and this is a worldwide mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, um, movement and uh, with a lot of consequences all over the world and this is also part in part of the, the book permanently. Mm -hmm. So it's called Europeana but I don't uh, limit it to the to European view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Also, also the f TV um, net news feed is from all over the world. Totally. Yeah, I won't. I won't say more about that because yeah. the the piece itself will speak for itself in terms of um, just so many so many different ways to think about it. Um, this relationship between geographical space and nationalities and continents and all of these things. Um, we should wrap up, but is there, are there any final things you want to talk about before, before we get to the show? Anything we didn't, we didn't hit? Um, um. The, there will be future productions, correct? For, um, Af after this one, it'll go back to Germany. Yes, we show right? we show it in in um, Germany. It's also another co-production partner is the uh, Ruhrtriennale, and and uh, we have an invitation to go to Russia, mm -hmm. Saint Petersburg for for the Theater Olympics, uh, which is a very very interesting um, theater festival, which happens in different countries um, every three four years. And um, and we also will show in one year from now we'll show this piece in Vienna. Mm -hmm. So and I'm very curious how it changed with the with the spaces because yeah. they have so much uh, character. Yeah, it's it seems almost as if this is a piece that could just keep going for decades and decades and continue evolving yes. through the changing <laughs> times. Some members of the audience said it's too short. <laughs> So it'll be up to you to decide. Um, thank you so much for talking with us. Thank you.